season three is when the plot really starts to pick up, and we start to see that there's more going on outside of the Reds and Blues. After two seasons of dicking around in a box canyon, now we really start to explore the world that is Red vs. Blue. When last we left off, the teams were scattered to hell and back. Simmons was trapped in some weird teleporter room, Church and Griff were imprisoned by Red Forces on Sidewinder, and Sergeant Caboose are in a creek where they come across what I can only assume is an online game of Halo 1 matchmaking. This group always confused me, but I assume they're here to illustrate how absurd the people you play with online are, and with that I sympathize. They try to get them to work for them, even going so far as to steal their flags, but true to the nature of online gamers, they're only interested in murder and bullshit. So Caboose does the only thing he knows how to do. <laughs> channel his inner O'Malley and kill everyone. Well, of course. Who wouldn't? Elsewhere in the known universe, we meet freelancer agent Wyoming as he's about to execute some poor schmuck. Right, here's the way this works. I ask you a question, you tell me an answer. One question, one answer. I don't get the answer I like, we've got a problem. And if we've got a problem, you've got a problem. Is that clear? How fitting. Wyoming's one of the two states I still need for Street Pass. He gets new orders from O'Malley. Eliminate Tucker because he knows about the whole red and blue are the same thingy. Tex gets the word over the radio and agrees to help Tucker fight him off. Eventually, Simmons manages to get Sergeant Caboose over to his location and manages to get Tucker, Donut, and Tex over as well. For some reason, Tucker's the only one that gets the black stuff on his armor. Caboose tries to help him locate Church, but in doing so, he accidentally hits the button to activate that 10 megaton nuclear bomb that's inside Church. Wyoming kills all the Reds at Sidewinder, then taunts Church and Griff with his plans like a stereotypical Bond villain, and leaves them to starve to death. But someone on the outside opens up the gate and allows them to leave. Meanwhile, the remainder of Red and Blue teams make it to Sidewinder, so finally everyone is together again. O'Malley activates a weather device that was stored inside of Lopez. Seriously, how many Doomsday devices does this guy have in him? that sends bolts of lightning down on the Blood Gulch crew. Simmons uses the teleporter to summon the grunts and have them teabag the ever-loving shit out of O'Malley. Sarge goes in to disarm the bomb, but a bolt of lightning hits Church and fuses the detonator, thus preventing it from being disarmed. Tucker decides to blow Church up with a rocket launcher, but Wyoming shoots it out of his hands as the timer hits zero. The bomb goes off, causing a rift in the very fabric of space and time and throwing our heroes into... the future. Oh, I can't fucking wait to hear this one. Or not. The time travel arc is one of the biggest plot points of the Blood Gulch Chronicles, and ag agreeably so, one of the most confusing to somebody watching for the first time. From a technical aspect, you can see it as a need to explain the jump from the Halo 1 engine to the Halo 2 engine, which graphically obviously looks a lot different. From a storytelling standpoint, well, at first it works out okay, but as, as the series progresses, you start asking a lot more questions, like... How did their weapons suddenly go from assault rifles and pistols to battle rifles and SMGs? Did they find a weapons cache near their location and decide to switch out? And why is the Warthog they find the exact same make and model as the one they used in Blood Gulch? I mean, unless the Apocalypse is truly 2,000 years old, you'd think they'd have upgraded somewhere along the line. And if the apocalypse did happen 2,000 years ago, then why is Command still around and looking exactly as it did in the past? And what about the other freelancers we meet? Were they blasted into the future as well? How? Why? Why would Command send a replacement for Captain Flowers 2,000 years late? In fact, wouldn't Caboose technically already be the replacement? I mean, they never officially reported Church's KIA, not on screen anyway, so as far as Command's records are concerned, there should still be three blues on Blood Gulch. The explanation is one that's not given until way later on down the line, and as much as I don't normally care about spoiler stuff, these particular spoilers are one that deserves to be mentioned at the time. So for now, just repeat to yourself, it's just a show, I should really just relax. You know, that one sentence would sum up this retrospective series quite nicely, but hey, if I went by that logic, then I'd never review anything, so fuck it, let's keep going. Anyway, after dicking around for a little while in their new settings, Tex contacts them and tells them she has found O'Malley. He's holed up in an abandoned doomsday fortress with one of the crazy grunts, and Lopez, who is now a disembodied head and will remain a disembodied head for the remainder of the Blood Gulch Chronicles. 
The fortress is defended by two machine gun turrets and a giant spinning blade of doom going exactly one mile per hour. Tex once again comes up with a plan that will work. Assault the base from different sides, then go in and plant a bomb that she made, blowing the base up and hopefully O'Malley along with it. Although that would probably kill Doc as well, but solid plan regardless. Despite the two machine gun turrets raining down death and destruction, the group manages to gain the upper hand. Tucker finds a mysterious glowing sword that turns him from a useless sack of crap to the beginnings of a real badass, although he's still got a way to go. Tex shoots Lopez's head off his turret, prompting a search for the Reds and leading to probably my favorite line in the series. You're sure it was Lopez? Well, I heard screaming in Spanish and bullets flying through the air, so either that was Lopez or this is Mexican New Year. I don't know what that being my favorite line says about me as a human being. Probably nothing good. Moving on. Caboose plants the bomb and then finds a computer playing a message from Church, warning him not to touch anything. It turns out the civilization that built this place has a prophecy foretelling of a blue figure dumber than anyone else in existence that will carry a glowing sword and bring hell on Earth. Of course, as soon as the message gets to that part, Tucker comes into the base carrying his new favorite toy, locking down the base with everyone inside it as the bomb's timer begins counting down. Would you stop saying bad things to come true? Or say them ten seconds earlier. Now while all this has been going on, Church has been walking around in the past, which apparently translates to a game of Marathon 2. He meets a computer named Gary, who tells him of the prophecy. Church decides that the only way to fix everything would be to go back in time and prevent any of this from happening. He is teleported to Blood Gulch to a time before the events of the first episode, where Lopez is still under construction, and Blue Team is still led by Captain Butch Flowers, who is voiced by Ed Robertson, lead singer of the Bare Naked Ladies. That's pretty cool. Now, in a weird twist of events, it turns out that everything that happened over the course of the series is either directly or indirectly a result of Church trying to fix things, and instead making them worse. He accidentally killed Captain Flowers of aspirin overdose, he kicked dirt into Lopez's switch that caused the inevitable leg failure, he failed to recognize Dona outside of the pink armor and thus did not manage to eliminate him before he got to the flag, he accidentally turned off friendly fire on Sheila that resulted in him getting killed, misstep after misstep after misstep. And this goes on for nearly an hour of Season 3's two-hour runtime. By the end of it, I'm not sure if everything we've seen up until now is a result of Church's interference, or if the events would have turned out the same one way or the other. Although I'm not sure how Caboose spotting Church running away and radioing to him would have resulted in him being infected, considering he was calling himself O'Malley before Tex was killed. Probably just an hour. Also, apparently time travel creates clones. I'm pretty sure Doctor Who explained in thorough detail why this is a bad thing. Eventually, Church just says fuck it and allows himself to be blown in the future with Caboose and the others, and tells Gary, who is the computer that was giving Caboose the uh, message, to deactivate the bomb. Turns out that the bomb is actually a sentient being named Andy, voiced by Nathan Zellner, and how Tex was not aware of this when she built him or how he knows Gary and Sheila when he's not even a day old is completely beyond me. Nevertheless, Andy's probably one of my favorites just because of how done he is with everybody. I don't think so. A bunch of shit knows if you ask me. And no one did ask me, which I find insulting. All right. O'Malley launches an all-out assault on the group with an army of robots that Lopez built, although how he built them without working hands is anybody's guess. These robots, designed to achieve victory in 24 hours, go exactly 1 to 2 miles per hour in order to achieve it in exactly that amount of time. Which, I mean, I, I guess I have to give credit for being precise. I mean, it kind of takes all the coolness out of an invading army of robots, but hey, do you want efficiency or do you want awesome? You can't have it both ways, people. Red Team picks up a distress signal over the radio of the Warthog, and with the chaos decides to leg it out of there to find it. I don't remember if they ever reveal who sent it, but I assume it's Sheila considering where they end up. As the robots continue their attack, Tex knocks Tucker out to use the sword against them. Red Team ends up in a cave and come out of the other side to find themselves in... No! Yep. Suddenly, sticky grenades are flying and robot parts are being blown everywhere, and I really hope you try to get that mental image out of your head as soon as possible. O'Malley is attacked by an unknown assailant, and his fate is left unclear. The Blues find out Tex was not behind the attack, as she, for whatever reason, can't get the sword to work. Church goes to ask Gary for more information about the Great Destroyer, just as a shadowy creature starts approaching from behind. Stop, 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 stop. Hey, if Tex is not the Destroyer from the Prophecy, then who is? Gary? 
Knock, knock. Who's there? And that's season three. If it seems like the season is shorter than the past two, it's really not. But you gotta remember that at least an hour of the two hour runtime for this season was dedicated to time travel and revisiting the past two seasons. Nevertheless, season three was a very important milestone for the show. Not only did we jump from Halo 1 to Halo 2, but we also really started to evolve the world and really start to explore more of it. And by now, we definitely have a better understanding of these characters. And the Halo 2 engine also offers new production techniques that will carry on into future seasons. From this point on, storytelling and production quality can only continue to go up. Unless you're season four, in which case it just kind of, sort of, stagnates. Yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys next time.